My name is Carol Metzler, and I'm uh, the science director here at Oregon Research Institute and a senior scientist. And I've been doing triple P research as a colleague of Matt's for the past 10 or 12 years. He's been a very, uh, well, he's been a terrific colleague to do research with, and um, I feel very honored to be his colleague. And Matt is the founder and developer of the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. And he's uh, the, a professor of clinical psychology and the director of the Parenting and Family Support Center at the University of Queensland in Australia. And he is at the core of the research and clinical work uh, that's being done with Triple P and has become very highly regarded internationally for conducting outstanding research and then translating that research into practical programs that help families and children to, to promote stronger families and to produce healthier outcomes for um, children and to prevent and address childhood behavior problems. Matt is also a world leader in the development, implementation, evaluation, and dissemination of population-based approaches to parenting and family interventions. And that's one thing that's quite unique about Triple P is its public health approach, the fact that it seeks to change uh, outcomes at a population level. So it's really a population-based approach. Triple P research has also grown into an international network of scientists and practitioners doing research on Triple P to improve children's and families' lives in dozens of countries around the world. Uh, the Triple P parenting system has now helped approximately 7 million families worldwide. It's used in 27 countries and has been translated into 19 languages other than English. More than 68,000 practitioners have been trained in its delivery. And Matt has consulted and advised governments at the most senior, you know, most uh, highest levels of government about policies for improving family and child outcomes at a population level through a public health approach um, to provide parenting support in a multitude of countries around the world, uh, including North America and Australia, Europe, the UK, Asia, Southeast Asia, and now even Africa. So in the process, Matt and his colleagues have learned a great deal about what it takes to make a community-wide approach to parenting support work. And it's exciting work, and Matt and all of those who are working with Triple P are making an important difference in the world. So we're, I, we're eager to hear what Matt has to share with us about his learnings about um, making uh, a Triple P or, or making a community-wide system work. So please join me in welcoming Matt Sanders, who will speak with us on making a community-wide approach to parenting support really work. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here uh, to share with you some of our learnings about how to uh, tackle the issue of parenting at a population level. Um, I'm going to try to focus my comments a little bit from the perspective of practitioners and agencies who are involved in the work of uh, delivering parenting programs. And most practitioners aspire to produce terrific outcomes with the families they work with. Um, and when you think about the adoption of evidence-based programs, you can have many, many studies that can demonstrate its value. But there's absolutely no certainty on any individual occasion that the program is going to work with the families you're working with. And so in a lot of ways, we need to think about what it takes to produce good outcomes with families, recognising that programs that are drawing on a body of theory and many years of research and experience, um, it involves skillful work. And this skillful work type takes time to become good at doing. I've been working in the parenting field for 35 years and I'm still learning how to respond appropriately to the many diverse circumstances that we will confront in supporting families in a complex and difficult role of raising their children. And so we can ask, you know, what can we do to ensure that uh, parents who participate in evidence-based programs like Triple P really benefit from it and so do their children. Now, one of the realities that we need to confront is that we live in a world where preparation for parenthood is not socially normative. Most people don't go to parenting classes or parenting courses of any type 
to learn to be a parent. There's an awful lot of learning through trial and error on the job. Uh, it's always been like that and it always will be like that. Uh, the challenge in a lot of ways is that when we develop evidence-based parenting programs, some of the parents of children at greatest risk are the least likely to participate. And if they do participate, they struggle with their engagement, so they're at greater risk for not completing the programs. So we need to think very carefully about what it is we do and how we reach out to families. Um, because we're living in a world where uh, we are quick to judge. When things go wrong with kids, there is many, many people out there who will point the finger at where things have gone wrong, and many parents feel blamed and shamed about various aspects of parenting. And I mean, some of the headlines that you get around the world are very interesting. I love this one here. Statistics show that teen pregnancy <laughs> drops off significantly after age 25. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and of course, you've got classic sort of the super nanny here with the tut, 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 and the disapproval of you know, what people are doing wrong and the, uh, the dramatisation of you know, young kids getting involved in early unprotected sexual activity, becoming parents as young as age 13. Well, parents get confused, they get defensive, and sometimes they get desperate when they're in a world of criticism, uh, other people passing judgment about what they are doing. And if we remind ourselves that most parents actually don't like unsolicited parenting advice, um, we've, got, uh, we've got a bit of challenge. So parents will often reach out to each other. Now, this is a posting I found on a parenting website. I'll just read it to you. Dear all, most parents these days think it's wrong to spank children, so I've tried other methods to control my kids when they're having one of those moments. Um, one that I found effective for me is just to take my child for a ride in the, uh, a car ride and talk. They usually calm down and stop misbehaving after our car ride together. I've included a photo of one of my sessions with my son in case you'd like to try the technique. <laughs> there, <laughs> there you go. Scaring the living daylights out of kids. Uh, is that the way forward? Well, hopefully not. When we think about the broader social ecology of parenthood and we think about the enablers and barriers that will facilitate par parents participating in a parenting program, we need to remind ourselves that all of these activities that you might think of as program specific actions that could be taken to entice parental engagement and involvement and destigmatization of programs are occurring in a wider social context, an ecological context that has to do with policies, to do with the family, law, um, the kinds of neighbourhoods people are living in, the economic climate that exists, the levels of employment, um, the degree of discrimination uh, parents may be experiencing in a community, particularly if they're minorities or refugee communities. Um, the extent to which help seeking around parenting is considered to be socially normative and so on. Now most of us in our everyday work don't operate at this policy level but it is highly relevant that uh, professionals who are knowledgeable and experienced in the field of parenting are prepared to develop a voice relating to seeking to influence the kinds of policies and practices that exist at a broader societal level. When we zero in on the, those things that we are in a better position to be able to influence directly, we can consider the type of program that is being offered itself. We can consider the type of messaging that's used. Um, what kind of examples are used in those messages? What kind of age groups? What kind of genders? Um, what are the circumstances of the families being depicted? Their ethnicity? We can think about the context of who provides the programs and the extent to which those um, practitioners have an affinity or similar to the uh, parents who are the recipient of their parenting advice. We can think about costs and accessibility issues to do with whether a program is, is free or people have to pay for it and if, if they're having to pay for it, how much 
if we're thinking about the program format, we might be thinking, is it in person, is it online, is it large group, small group, is it with telephone assistance, is it with web assistance, is it a completely self-directed program? And we can think about the cultural acceptability of the exemplars that are employed to illustrate the principles and techniques of the, uh, of the program. We can also do something about the context within which parents are actually um, uh, are receiving the intervention. Are they doing it um, in a family context in the home with the support of other parents or other people in that person's social world? Um, is it in an environment with the support of a grandparent or uh, a parent-in-law or a trusted friend, neighbour or relative? Are they doing it on their own? Are they doing it with um, known and trusted people in their social network? And so once we start to think about those things that could be varied that might increase the likelihood of parental engagement, parental commitment, parental continuation of their commitment and involvement, we can see that there are quite a few things that we can actually do with evidence-based practices to, in a sense, have a greater level of customization and tailoring. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the classes of variables that we can do something about, other than to draw to your attention is that there are levers that have to do with program design, how they're uh, offered and delivered in the community, that could make a significant difference to the level of participation and therefore population reach of the programs. Now, in the design of the Triple P model, we tried to avoid the notion of having this sort of one size that fits all. You develop a program, it's got eight to ten sessions or twenty sessions or eighteen sessions or whatever it is and say, look, that's the formula, that's what we're going to put everyone into based on the assumption that it's a good enough fit to, for it to be, uh, to be viable. What we recognised is that parenting concerns and parents' aspirations for seeking information and advice about their children and how to deal with their parenting issues vary considerably. Parents have differing capacities to engage in multi-session programs and different aspirations to do so. Um, if you think about, um, I mean sometimes it's worth just asking this really basic question. Think of enrolling yourself in some kind of course or program and ask yourself this basic question. How many of you could guarantee that you could attend for 12 sessions in a row over a three month period without an interruption to your attendance at all? Whether it's the gym, whether it's going to a choir, whether it's whatever it is, just raise your hands if you're confident that you could do that. No one's hands went up. Parents are no different. I mean, they, they are living in worlds where their commitment to engagement in parenting programs is competing all the time with other priorities, other things that are happening in their life. And so to create a, a formulaic solution that is defined in terms of a, a specific number of sessions and that's all you ever offer to the parenting community is making it hard for people. So in the design of the Triple P system, we wanted to develop a system that was much more flexible and need responsive. So a media and communication strategy that I'll illustrate in a little bit more detail in the moment is about competing with all of those negative messages that are parent blaming, they're attacking parents. This is about messaging to create hope, to create a sense of possibility, to create pull demand in the community so that parents themselves are seeing this participation in a parenting program as a serious and worthwhile investment of their time. And quite often when we do an economic analysis of programs, we don't take into account the amount of time parents have to invest in learning the skill or applying the skill. We think of it in terms of what's it's costing the government, what's it's costing for training and professional time, but not the consumer's time. So when we have a media and communication strategy that's creating pull demand, we wanted to have some light touch offers that would enable parents 
to have a window of engagement into the Triple P model. And so we developed a seminar series. And these are uh, the power of positive parenting, raising confident, competent children, raising resilient children. And they're a series, but they're all standalone. And they're all tasters. They're uh, things that parents can go along to for 90 minutes in a completely destigmatized context to find out about Triple P and if they're needing more, to get more. If they've got enough, they can walk away from that without any further involvement. Um, this, this was then supplemented by narrow focus parenting skills training. We call them Triple P discussion groups. They're topic and age specific. Bedtime problems, dealing with disobedience, dealing with tantrums, sibling conflict, homework problems. They are packaged solutions that are offered in two hour workshops basically that parents come along to. And uh, we've now done a substantial amount of evaluation of these topic specific interventions and found some surprisingly powerful outcomes stemming from this work. And then you end up moving towards level five and uh, level four and level five, which the more are the more uh, traditional, active, intensive skills training programs, eight to ten sessions uh, for level four, up to twelve sessions for for level five. Now, what I'm going to take you through is some of our learnings about how to make these levels of intervention really hum. What, we've know, what we know about their outcomes, what we know about the challenges that parents can have with the engagement. So the starting point is this question of increasing reach of our interventions through effective communication strategies. Now the idea of stay positive was uh, originally developed and funded by the Amsterdam City Council for a large scale rollout of Triple P in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, the creative around the design of this media and communication strategy uh, was very clever. It was so clever, in fact, that we wanted to incorporate it into the Triple P system. So the whole system of Triple P, when uh, uh, counties, when countries are rolling it out, they can access this um, well-developed, carefully designed co communication strategy. And fundamentally, it's about normalising uh, participating in parenting programs. It's to get rid of that stigma where parents feel that I'm not that sort of parent, you know, I'm, I don't need to do that kind of class, because they associate it with stigma. They associate it with the possibility of their children being removed. They associate it with these are the things that bad parents or inadequate or incompetent parents are doing, rather than this is something that parents aspire to. They aspire to it because it produces positive outcomes for children. That it, and it's not about preventing violence, it's not about preventing substance abuse or kids getting into all sorts of strife at school. So long as we frame the offer in terms of turning off negativity, it's never going to inspire a following where families are seeking to access it because they know it'll improve their kids' language skills, it'll improve their social skills. It'll improve how well they're doing at school, their friendship making skills, enable them to avoid peer victimisation and so on. So the idea is to normalise, destigmatise and validate what parents are already doing. If you think about it from the perspective of parents being problem solvers, whenever they come to a parenting program, you automatically, I automatically assume that parents have tried to solve the problem that they're confronting with their kids. Soon as you put the parent in the frame of being a problem solver, it means that what you can do with their problem solving efforts is validate those things that they're doing well and that they're um, able to do on their own. And um, the many, many, many parents with quite severe problems with kids are doing the vast majority of things right. You know, And a lot of these parents don't need skills training, they need combinations. They need to know if you combine this and this, will that work? I've tried this on its own, it doesn't work with my child. But sometimes the key to it is the right combinations. And, uh, and also very powerful modelling where they see what it looks like in action. It's hard to imagine the successful management of a really severe temper tantrum unless you've seen it done unless you've seen what a skillful parent using good control of their own emotion, 
clear calm instructions, being able to follow through with appropriate backup consequences, and remaining that firm resolve and calm. When you see it in action, you know what it's about. Um, if you just read about it, it's much harder to get the sense. So the idea is one of empowering parents to, um, uh, to extend their problem-solving capacities. This is California, Los Angeles. This is really just an example of powerful images and branding of the, uh, the program. So when we think about advertising and promoting, um, for example, our, our current large-scale rollout has attracted an enormous amount of media interest and virtually all of the stories that are done on the news and um, um, advertising bi bits are done pro bono. They're done free. They're not, they're, it doesn't cost us to roll this out. Um, there's a substantial amount of media coverage that stems from um, a advertising and promoting the parenting seminars. Just to give you an example, um, I did a road show in Queensland. Um, just to give you an idea of how big our state is, um, it's got a pop the population of Oregon, but to get in an aeroplane to fly from Brisbane, which is in the southeast corner of our state, to the north of the state takes three and a half hours in a plane in a jet. Uh, it takes two hours to fly to the west and so we've got the, that's the western border of our state to join the next state. And so when we talk about isolation of parents, out of that uh, about four and a half million, about two and a half million are in the bottom, bottom southeast corner of the state. The city of Brisbane, the Gold Coast and uh, the, the Sunshine Coast. The rest of the population is dispersed across this huge area that's as big as California. And so when you think about remoteness and isolation, we were the first group to evaluate um, Triple P uh, as a telephone-based intervention with rural and remote families. Um, we did this because we had parents who were um, being identified in rural areas with significant behavioural and emotional problems and the concept of going to a once a week parenting class was simply irrelevant. I can remember one parent I was talking to, she had a driveway from her, from the, the, the street, the, the road to her house of 50 kilometres. The nearest neighbour she had was over 200 kilometres away and she had an out of control preschooler. So the idea of jumping in the car and attending a parenting class um, was irrelevant. So you needed to, we needed to think flexibly about delivery. Now the issue that I would just draw to your attention is that when you think about most parents, 
they're pre-contemplative with respect to engagement in a parenting program. We need to move them from being pre-contemplative, never really thought about it, to contemplating it, then ready for action. Um, and over this process, the parent is becoming aware of Triple P. They're hearing about it from friends, neighbours, relatives, professionals, advertising. Um, the most common pathway into Triple P is hearing about it from someone they know, a friend, neighbour or relative. Most people who enrol in Triple P hear about it from three different sources. A professional friend, neighbour or relative who's done it uh, and then reading something about it with, with, with advertising. So they get, they're intending to participate, they enrol, they attend the first session and what we want them to do is when they start to be fully engaged and to complete it, including completing the evaluation. So we need to think about what are the enablers and barriers for this movement along this trajectory of uh, increasing level of commitment. And so <clears throat> when we think about the types of families in the community that um, if you just put out a general community release about parenting, even if you're advertising it well, um, it's free, it's high quality, um, the parents who've done it so far all think it's fantastic. Just because it meets all of those criteria doesn't mean parents are going to flock to it. And so we have to remember that our um, attempts to engage families are competing with lots of other things that, uh, that are trying to grab parental attention. And so in general what you will find is lower participation rates of fathers, single parents, teen parents, minorities, refugees, parents living in extreme poverty, I'm talking about extreme poverty, and indigenous parents. Um, you're less likely to get parents coming forward who are foster parents, step parents, adoptive parents or kinship carers. You're less likely to have parents with serious mental health or substance abuse problems. Parents of children with chronic health problems uh, uh, in the children and parents with disabilities and chronic health problems themselves. So the thing to just remind ourselves of, you're thinking, well gee, this, these are the groups of families who have the most difficult and troubled kids yet they're not being engaged at the, uh, in the, at the same level as other families are um, who, have, who perhaps are more typically developing families with kids with problems but they don't have other complications in their lives. So what's been learned about engagement of these families is that targeted outreach seems to be very important. For example, to engage the indigenous uh, Aboriginal population in both Canada and Australia, it's really important to have the indigenous um, health services and organisations that serve those indigenous populations engaged in the process because they have access to the families. The families are initiating contact with those groups to a much greater extent than they will, um, for example, to attend uh, a universal offer that's through a school. Or, uh, and so when we think about this notion of proportionate universalism, what, it's, what Marmot was referring to here is having a program, a pop population-based program that is available for all, but there are some segments of that population who are particularly vulnerable and at risk who need special attention in terms of engagement and outreach. Professional advocacy and leadership. If you think about the role of principals in a school and the influence they have about what parents would consider to be socially normative with respect to the enrolment process, we have many schools now where principals very strongly advocate that parents, if they're enrolling their children in their school, enrol themselves in Triple P at the point of transition of coming into the school. And when leaders speak like this, it actually, parents do listen. 
what I like to think is that if we can offer programs which are open to everybody and say to them, this is something to help, this isn't something for bad parents, this is something that will help all parents, and I wish as a parent I'd have had the opportunity to do it myself, I think if we can go that way, I think we can reach more parents and they don't see it as somebody saying, we're going to tell you how to bring your children up properly because you clearly don't know how. I'm the mother of a disabled child. Peer-to-peer -peer advocacy. Down syndrome is the diagnosis. Um, she's not always been with me. And caring for a child 24 hours a day can be strenuous when you're a single parent. So give me some strategies to help me better care for me and her. I said, okay, I'm willing to try anything. <laughs> Since I'm going to be in this for the long haul. Yeah, those information sheets, when they give you for a particular type of behaviors, they give you information what you could possibly say instead of trying to wing it on your own. You say, oh, okay, I have this. And the thing that I love the most is the role plays. You get the opportunity to practice. And the child is not injured or you're not injured in the process, but those things are wonderful. I love it. It really was simple and it really was practical. That's what I like. It wasn't anything that you had to go buy a bunch of stuff, read a lot of books, do a lot of videos. It was really plain and simple and straight to the point. It was friendly music. That's what I would say with you. Do you need to try it out? I assure you, it will work. Trust me. If I survive, you can survive with better tools. And you will be a little bit stress free. Parents are highly attuned to parents like them that have had similar experiences that uh, their advocacy voice uh, can become very powerful. Um, a number of groups, community groups running Triple P in the UK have begun to use former graduates from previous programs to assist the presenter introduce the program. And it's to do with kind of validation uh, of the importance of the program and the skills they're going to learn by someone just like them. So, for example, I can remember um, being at a professional gathering um, in the south of England once, and uh, a social worker came up to me um, after I'd done a presentation like this, and uh, she had a couple of women with her, and she said, look, um, uh, Matt, I'd, I'd really like to introduce someone to you. And um, she, she brought these two women over, boy, and they, they looked pretty tough. You know, they had tats all over their face and arms and had sort of rings from every orifice you could think about. And, um, <coughs> and one of these mums said, I just wanted to thank you because um, I'm a heroin addict and doing Triple P meant that I could get my child back and that um, she said, I'm now working with Joan, who is the social worker, to help other addicted women um, do the same thing. And she's just sort of wanting to pass that message on to me personally about her journey, about how parenting assisted her with her drug addiction problem. You know, we often think about who's a non-responder to parenting programs, and you think about screening out people who are not going to benefit. How about screening in many people who will benefit, who've got serious mental health problems, substance abuse difficulties, for whom doing a good quality parenting program can be extremely important. So when we start to think about strategies for improving participation, here are some summary, uh, here's a summary of some ideas. Uh, first of all, normalising the participation. What it is about is creating pull demand. It's not about push demand, about pushing information out to parents. It's about creating an appetite in the parenting community to want to do this in the same way people want to get their driver's license so they can drive on our roads. Um, and so if you think about the combination of powerful uh, social marketing with peer-to-peer -peer testimonials, what we're on about is fanning a social contagion. If parents who've had a good experience then talk to friend, neighbour or relative and encourage their involvement, we can spread the word much more powerfully than we can uh, through other means. Um, if we also focus on targeting normative developmental transitions, families are often highly attuned to wanting to present themselves well at a point of transition, like for example when they're enrolling their children at a new school. Um, and so most uh, schools will say parents will bend over backwards, you know, in the first few months after beginning 
their children's beginning careers in an in a elementary school, that window closes within a few months. And so that the, the, it's kind of like that heightened receptivity at a point of uh, transition. Uh, and the other thing is to have a, an, an approach that is seriously about the engagement of consumers and end users. We now do lots of focus groups with uh, um, parents who are going to be the recipients of the intervention, with practitioners who are going to deliver the intervention. And what we're trying to do is establish the relevance, the cultural fit, um, the kinds of exemplars that will be appropriate for this target population to the end goal is increased population reach of the intervention. Now, apart from social marketing, we can think about the value of low intensity interventions. Now, this is, um, has been a, a focus of considerably increased attention in recent years uh, and a number of randomised trials are now being uh, published around these low intensity level two interventions with triple P. Now you can think about these as kind of, this is a seminar being conducted in a, a school library. Um, the series for kids transitioning to school, there are the three topics here, raising, um, sorry, power of positive parenting, raising confident, competent children, raising resilient children. Now, I had the privilege of going around our state running a series of these seminars to kick off the latest round of our state-based implementation of Triple P free for all families from birth to age 16. Um, and in every location I was in, in Cairns they had 450 parents. The local um, uh, um, introduction of this involved a very clever uh, kind of media strategy that involved doing a, uh, a, a taking the pulse of the parenting population survey before we hit the road to find out in March of this year what were the hot button issues of parents in Cairns, in Townsville, in Mackay, <clears throat> in, uh, um, in Rockhampton. And then to set up an arrangement with the local media to do a story around the hot button issues of parents living in this location. And so at every place that I went to, we had a media call at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know who was at that media call? The local politician of the area. Um, that politician had been involved in doing a letterbox drop to every constituent in his electorate to get parents to come along and to be seen to be supporting families and supporting kids. In addition, we had a member from the Australian Medical Association and the AMA was wanting to support this public health initiative around positive parenting. They provided a doctor to be interviewed. Um, the local child, early childhood people provided a parent and a child and then at the media call we had every television station, we had all the newspapers and we had all the radios. And so in every location there was a multiple kind of engagement of the carrier of the voice of public opinion going out through multiple kind of mediums. And, um, and this happened in each location uh, down, the, down the state. So we got 450 in Cairns, we got 250 in each of the other locations pretty much. Um, the politicians, they're all into social media, so they were twittering about their seminar and they were competing with each other about who got the largest number of parents <laughs> along. And it became something that um, the community could get behind and that uh, the, the, the media is part of the community. Rather than having this adversarial kind of, you know, what's this about and what are these folk from the south of the state trying to tell us northerners what to do and we're different up here, you realise, and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, localism runs rife everywhere. But to have the survey about the needs of the parenting population to create the local story about what this meant for mums and dads and cans men's, meant it was much more interesting and engaging for the media. For me, this thing was, there's a few different strategies that I can use at home with my toddler to ensure that I avoid going down a shouting track at him. I think that's frustrating 
One of the key, take key takeaways for me was um, more around my behaviour, not, not my son's behaviour. I'm going to definitely lower my voice <laughs> and uh, speak positive. Reasonable expectations. There are a lot of things that I know my son can be doing for himself that I tend to do for him. So I'm going to be putting that into place very soon. As soon as I get home. <laughs> oh, really worthwhile parenting advice. It's good to, to you know, hear an expert and to, you know, sort of analyse those things, not in too much depth, but to, um, you know, get the key pointers and, and those take-home messages that we talked about. So, you know, it was really worthwhile. Um, I, I found it really, you know, encouraging. 95% of parents who do a positive parenting seminar report having a clear intention of changing their parent parenting immediately. And so they're, they're moving away from these seminars with a clear behavioural intention to make change, and they do. Um, when you think about then parents being um, able to participate in other levels of the intervention, and what I'm illustrating here is primarily the group-based programs at this stage because you can deliver deliver each of these levels individually as well. It doesn't need to be in a group. But in the um, level three groups, we're talking about discussion groups. The parents get a workbook. It's a two-hour session. There is, um, they're very uh, solution-focused around particular things like developing a good bedtime routine, dealing with disobedience, hassle-free shopping, and so on. And these are just a selection of the topics that have been subjected to uh, controlled evaluations in randomised trials. Um, one example of how low intensity interventions might speak to resource poor communities stem from work that was published by Annalena Major, uh, uh, Rachel Kalem and myself in uh, Prevention Science relating to the application of this discussion group context in um, uh, a low and middle income country, in this instance it was Panama. Now part of this work was to establish first of all what parents wanted to do, what kind of parenting support or advice they wanted. Their number one preference was for brief single session parenting programs. And so that's what we tested. We had an option to go for multiple, multi-week multi, um, programs or to go for sort of large group seminars. But this is the context they wanted to do and the randomised trial was taking place in this sort of environment. These are families living in pretty extreme poverty, 70% living on less than $300 a month, most parents struggling to get money to cover their basic needs, living in small homes, high urban crime rates, parents, most of them, hadn't finished high school and very concerned about their kids' involvement in gang activity. Um, this was funded by the National Secretariat of Science, Technology and Innovation in Panama. And these are the trials, trial results from this um, RCT that captures the impact on the ECB intensity scores, which is a widely used standardised measure of outcome in virtually all parent training studies will use this kind of, kind of measure, um, showing uh, a highly significant oops, reduction. Oops highly significant reduction in uh, the intensity of behaviour difficulties with an effect size of one, which is a pretty impressive effect size for a two hour intervention with uh, follow up um, where the kids are now well into the normal range of functioning compared to the control condition. And there were impacts at a lower level on dysfunctional parenting and parental distress. But this is the kind of intervention that is deployable and scalable in resource poor environments. Um, I took up the language of public special care. Okay, this is a parent who has participated in um, a discussion group in Brisbane around uh, dealing, uh, dealing with disobedience and she was, she's been asked what's the key take home from you, for you from this? Yes, um, 
lot of people wanting to engage in the conversation with their parents and yeah, so probably try to firstly start manage my own stress and manage my own emotion first and not to pass it on to my partner or my own kids. Yeah, so I mean it's interesting what the parents will be saying about what they're taking out. The focus was on dealing with disobedience. What she realised is that she was always saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And the kids were never getting kind of that spontaneous attention when they're behaving appropriately to get a parental audience to respond to the need of the moment. And of course the kids learned to escalate and she was just massively into this, uh, into this pattern of behaviour. But that was the takeout for her. And it was quite meaningful and it was very emotional for her because, you know, she talked about feeling somewhat guilty about it. Um, but for a lot of parents who are confronting something that they're doing that they need to change, there is that moment of realisation that, hey, it's me. I've actually got to do something different here. Um, when we think about the movement of parents into the more higher intensity programs that are the more traditional um, active skills training, coaching feedback, practice, rehearsal, that kind of thing, um, families who are participating in this level of intervention often have children with more severe behaviour difficulties. Um, and it's interesting when you start thinking about who is this kind of program going to really work for um, most people don't generally think of families like this. My name is Sammy. I'm married to Shane. We have six children. We have a dog and seven veggies. We live in a two bedroom house. Uh, my children are aged 11, 9, 7, 4, and we have 15 month year old twins, Sophie May and Archie. I thought I was doing a pretty good job. But I wasn't because my kids didn't have no respect for me. And I, I didn't feel, I've always thought, well, where was I going wrong? Because my husband is very firm and that they love him, do as they're told, every, respect him. I realised I did do practically everything for them. So little changes had to come into place, like sitting nicely and not jumping on the sofa as a trampoline. Just a, a lot of little things, making their own beds, whereas I would always do that. It would be in my kind of routine, but they do, they do that now. It, it's a lot of little things. Everything has changed since doing the trophy. The relationship with my husband, I feel so much better towards him. He feels better with me because he knows that I'm, I'm being firm but fair, doing what I mean. Where well, everything I say, I'm carrying it out, which he likes that. The children know that I'm not a soft touch anymore. So yeah, so overall, everything has just got better. I feel so much excited now because it's lovely having rewards. The children are giving me respect. They're telling me they love me. They're saying please and thank you. I'm asking them to do something once and they're listening to me and not messing around and I've had the support of my husband so I'm feeling yes it's it's better and I'm telling myself I've won that one because usually the children would, would win over me every time everybody's so much happier I'm happier the children are happier you only have to get a few things right to make a lot of things just come smoothly you only have to get a few things right to make a lot of things come right. I think that's very profound in a lot of ways because when you see a sea of complexity, you know, you see problems everywhere. And sometimes the solution has to do with elegant simplicity. And it's kind of like um, when parents see they've made these kind of adjustments in how they're doing things, their expectations, their level of follow through. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't surprise me now that we've got this sort of massively growing evidence base to really show that the effects of good quality parenting programs are system level effects. They're not just affecting children's behaviour, they're affect, affecting many different types of relationships within the family. 
And when you ask parents about what's different for you, you can see how much more confident they are, how much happier they are in the parenting role, and how much more they're enjoying their children, which is fantastic really, isn't it? It's uh, to think that's been able to be accomplished within a relatively brief space of time. So when you think of an evidence-based program and its delivery in the community and the need to ensure that as a clinician, as a practitioner delivering these programs, we are responsive to need, that means that we need to use evidence-based practices but in the context of appropriate tailoring to the family's requirements in front of us. So let me give you an example of the kind of tailoring work that we've done in Triple P so that you get a sense of how this kind of looks. So um, we know that there's a lot of custodial grandparents who take over the parenting role when parents, the, the, the child's actual parents, biological parents are not functioning well or overwhelmed with mental health problems, substance abuse, they might be in prison or whatever it could be. And so we were wanting to develop a variant of group triple P that would be appropriate to grandparents. So we looked at the theory about adult development and the role of grandparenting and the sandwich generation and the club sandwich generation of you know, having an older parent and an adult youngster and grandkids and so on. We did a whole bunch of consumer groups and uh, 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 surveys of uh, grandparents about the issues that they were confronting in their grandparent role to find out what were the hot button issues that they were concerned about. And the number one was, uh, one was um, concern about how to talk to their kids about the grandchildren's behaviour. That was the hardest topic that they reported having difficulty with. And then we wanted to look at, well, what is the existing evidence base relating to parenting programs with, with grandparents? And there was very little. And so we developed this tailored variant of group triple P, which was mainly um, adding some extra elements to do with conflict management and communication between adults relating to the negotiation of the grandparent role and dealing with uh, disagreement. Uh, combining that with all of the existing activities that went on in group triple P, then conducting an RCT, uh, which is now being published in behaviour therapy. Um, but what we were finding, is, interestingly, is a three-generational benefit. The grandparents function better, the parents function better, and the grandchildren function better. So a single in intervention impacting on three generations. And I just want to sh sort of share with you um, what changes about the nature of the interaction between the grandparent and the, uh, the child's uh, actual parent. This is discussion about bedtime, a problem solving discussion that was done pre and post uh, participating in Triple P, just for the grandparent. I have had absolutely no trouble getting her to bed. Mm. Nor have I. Just during the week. I've been putting in about 7.30. No, you have No, you haven't. Yes, I have. You and I have had this debate and I said no, I don't want to... No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I don't need to go to bed. If I go to bed at 8.30... You do not. Uh, not in the last two years I've lived here. I've never seen you go to bed at 8.30. You know why? Because when you're... It's all my fault. Okay, get the picture. <laughs> All right, and so this is where they get to in terms of the way in which they're discussing the same issue after grandparent triple P. Okay, so you can see that the affective tone of the interaction has changed. There's not the blaming and accusatory kind of process. They're much more uh, collaborative about the discussion. And remember, this is occurring primarily because the grandparent is doing triple P, not the biological parent, the grandparent. And so what we're seeing here 
Um, the, grand, the actual biological parent just got the workbook. They didn't actually attend the sessions with the grandparent. But we were getting um, similar intervention effects on the primary outcome fa variables for uh, both the grandparent uh, and the, um, the biological parent. Uh, they were similar and to uh, a fairly healthy effect sizes of Cohen's D of 0.73 and 0.82 for the grandparent, um, which is uh, a pretty good result really. Okay, um, the other thing when you think about the internet and you think about what med modern parents are saying about how they wish to access parenting information, we know that uh, Google is the friend of many parents searching for information. In fact, we've never had better access to knowledge about parenting than the current generation has. Uh, you do a Google search on positive parenting, you get millions of hits. Uh, there's some really wacky information out there that's confusing, it's contradictory, it's hard to tell the evidence-based stuff from the uh, non-evidence-based material. And there's been a kind of a pervasive assumption that that's all very well, but the internet really, that's middle-class parents want that. Um, well, it's simply not true. I mean, the vast, vast majority of the population are online. Um, they uh, uh, are accessing the internet, many through their phones. And so the development of a, um, uh, an evidence-based online program that could be provided to parents uh, is something that we took quite some time to move towards and we wanted to develop a small number of high quality um, web-based programs that uh, we could subject to careful evaluation before they were rolled out. And so our first foray into this was an eight module online program um, and basically parents could have a number of um, this is a number of features of this online program. They see lots of um, video clips of families in action demonstrating the skills. There's lots of individual goal setting, downloadable workbooks, tip sheets uh, and so on that can assist with the parents navigation through the program. There are various modules that parents can work through and they have me as their online personal coach uh, that assists them uh, go through this process. These are the results of the first trial that were, was published in Behaviour Therapy looking at this online program. There's now been five RCTs that have evaluated the online intervention and pretty much found similar effects. Um, so showing compared to um, a, a, a care as usual condition, um, the uh, internet condition was associated with a significant sustained reduction in problem behaviour and medium to large effect sizes across all of the usual suspects that we would be looking for to shift with a, with a parenting program. So um, what we've most recently completed is a study that added phone calls to doing online and what we found is that the completion rates were higher with phone support. Um, the effect sizes were larger. It was a three group design. Um, internet use as usual, so people could use the internet to get any parenting advice they wanted versus Triple P online without professional support or Triple P online with professional support. They got five phone calls. Um, they could have had eight, but they, the, the, the mean number was five uh, that received. And basically, the, there was a significantly higher level of module completion and larger effect sizes with the assisted intervention, which means that e even though the doing it on your own was more effective than the control, it was more effective again to have online support. So when we start to think about families with more complex presentations, parents of kids with challenging behaviours in the context of a developmental disability, for example, we've developed a whole parallel system in Triple P called Stepping Stones Triple P for parents uh, of children with, uh, with disabilities. So this is used with parents of kids with autism, with Asperger's syndrome, with um, intellectual impairment, with physical disabilities, with parents uh, who have children with hearing impairments, vision impairments uh, and so on, traumatic brain injuries. And um, the, the program uh, has interestingly shown very similar effect sizes regardless of the type of disability. And so it doesn't seem to matter what kind of disability the child has, 
that the parenting skills that are learnt in, uh, in this program seem to be uh, very important and produce um, uh, solid outcomes. So we're involved in a large-scale population-based rollout of stepping stones across um, three states in Australia and uh, in Queensland, Victoria and New South Wales. And this is a common experience of parents who have done it. My name is Pamela Howard. I have a four and a half year old son, Riley Howard. Riley was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Before stepping stones, Riley had many, many meltdowns. Um, screaming and grunting and yelling for hour after hour after hour. And, it's, and you can't do anything about it. I just wanted it to stop. I was starting to think maybe I was a bad mother. If I needed to go down to the shops, he would not hold my hand. He would always pull away from me. Frighteningly enough, I had the to experience my son running in front of one bus and two four wheel drives. But fortunately, the drivers were driving slow enough that they stopped and there's no incident. My name is Carolyn Jarvis. Um, I'm married and I've got three children. The two older ones are teenagers and the younger one is nine and he has autism. Before stepping stones, we had trouble at home just with Nicholas's basic behaviour and the other two children, the older ones, were getting upset that he was going to get away with things, which he was. We could never go out as a family. I'm a husband or I always stay at home with Nicholas. So he didn't get to go out and we couldn't go out as a complete family, which was upsetting to us all. We see um, a lot of parents whose children are very, very difficult. A lot of children have had autism, but also have worked with um, parents whose children have intellectual impairment without other disorders attached, with children um, with tuberous sclerosis, um, Down syndrome, and next group I know someone's coming along whose child has cerebral palsy. I think the best thing about stepping stones for the parents is the confidence that it gives them. The confidence to actually use those strategies and change their child's behaviour and therefore build their rapport, rapport with their child and become more in tune with their child. Everything's just about automatic. I have a number of different strategies and techniques that just come to me. And it, it seems like I've always, it feels like I've always known them and gosh, I'm good. <laughs> because of the strategies that I put in place, um, I've now been able to go to every one of my son's basketball games with my husband and Nicholas to watch him and that it's life changing it really is to be able to be a family we can go out for a meal we can go to the shops we can go to the park and we can just be together it's been life changing I don't have that fear for Riley's safety anymore I'll yell at him and go Riley stop and he stops it and he looks around to me and I'll say wait or come back here whatever the situation might be and he follows in the direction. I touch wood. <laughs> it's, it's been fantastic. I've got a child now who will listen to me. My teenagers are thrilled that Nicholas has responsibilities in the house now. Um, he's not treated like a baby anymore. If he makes a mess, he has to clean it up. He has to follow through. And they just feel that it's fair and they can see him growing up. Yeah, I'm a lot less stressed about him. The change in my son, oh gosh, yeah. it, um, it brings me to tears a lot of time just thinking of it because he's, he's a different boy. He's a happier boy, I'm a happier mother. <laughs> um, I, I, I've seen him flourish. I've stopped labelling myself a bad mother. <laughs> okay, so when we think about the fundamental goal of a parenting strategy, I think what we should be focusing on is this concept of parental self-regulation. 
Now, Paul Carroll defined this as those processes, internal or transactional, that enable an individual to guide his or her own goal-directed activities over time and across changing circumstances. And this regulation implies the modulation of thought, affect, behaviour and attention via deliberate activities and uh, things that you do to manage or solve a problem or to deal with a problem uh, that you're confronted with. Now, a lot of professionals, when they think about this notion of self-regulation, are not quite sure what it looks like. And so what I've put up on this slide is a sense of what a self-regulated parent can do, what it is they, we're seeking to, to, to create. First of all, the parent is likely to have a clear sense of purpose. They know what behaviours, skills and values they wish to promote in their children and, and themselves as a parent. They're likely to have realistic expectations of their kids, so not expect the impossible or things that are unreasonable. And they self-monitor, they're attuned to what's going on and they do this automatically rather than consciously or deliberately. So most of the time, self-regulated activity is very natural. It's the natural flow or stream of behaviour that's occurring without anxious, fretful monitoring or tracking of what you're doing. However, when a parent confronts a situation where their own personal standards, their values are violated. So for example, the parent has an aspiration to be able to leave home, to go to work, to take kids to school without threatening or hitting or yelling. But they're finding themselves in the situation in the morning of having to do the hurry ups. The kids are doing the go slows. And they're finding themselves getting frustrated and angry and irritated what a self-regulated parent will do is quickly realise they're about to lose it. They're aware of their own arousal, they're getting upset, and then they will take actions to bring their own behaviour under control. And so this will involve applying their knowledge that they've learnt in Triple P or other parenting programs to apply at this moment to avoid that explosion that they would have otherwise had. They carry out a plan, they revise it as needed, they expect to have a successful outcome um, through their own efforts. The parent is reflective and they're capable of identifying what they're doing well and not so well, but they don't beat up on themselves by being unhelpfully self-critical. These reflections that the parent has increase their sense of self-efficacy and personal agency and they mostly enjoy the process. Now, what I just want to draw to your attention is that there's something about the goal of self-control, of self-regulation in both parents and in kids. Uh, there's one important study that was conducted in Dunedin in New Zealand that uh, uh, Terry Moffat wrote about as a, a senior author and it was looking at over a 30 year period the measures, measured level of self-control in three-year-olds, their capacity to regulate their behaviour and their emotions, and then they followed these families up 30 years later when the kids were now 33. And what they found was that the level of self-control in kids predicted three main things, their health, their wealth, and their criminality. This was after controlling for, at time one, poverty and the educational level of the parent. And so when they sometimes tell that story and parents hear that, you know, they've got a four-year-old and it's too late and the first thousand days of life are over and, you know, is, it, uh, is my kid doomed to be in jail and have uh, no money and, you know, be unemployed and have bad health? Well, no, it doesn't mean that at all. However, what it does mean is that parenting practices that enable kids to gain better control over their own behaviour and emotion is likely to have... Uh, great de developmental advantages for those kids. And of course, Sesame Street is a great advocate for this principle.
<laughs> well, you get, the, you, get, you get the picture. And of course, self-regulation is more than delaying gratification. But it captures one of the things that um, I think is sometimes uh, troublesome for parents, and that is that the, they're, they're dealing with situations where kids are losing their emotions and they become so over embroiled in the calm down process of kids getting their emotions back under control that they engage in actions that inadvertently feed it and create prompt dependent learners where the kids don't build a bridge and get over it. What they learn is to rely on their parents to calm them down in order to um, be able to move on. So look, I'd like to end with a kind of a summary of our sort of key learnings about what is needed to achieve population level change with parenting. First of all is the document, clear documentation of need. Now one of the things that can be done here is to use population level surveys of parenting practices and use available administrative data that can be captured relating to rates of child maltreatment, hospitalisation and injury, out of home placements, um, school records. If the, the um, available data that can be aggregated and then linked at a case level can be uh, captured to define the extent of the problem prior to the introduction of the intervention, then you've got a way of tracking the way the, the, the effects of the implementation of a rollout in terms of population level indicators of the outcome. Not just clinical change at the individual case level where families have participated in triple fee. Now what's also needed is a clear theoretical framework. I've made the case for the importance of self-regulatory processes in parents and we know that the interventions that are most likely to, to, to work are drawn broadly from social learning and cognitive behavioural um, theory that underpins many of the strategies. Um, we needed to build a strong evidence base. If you think about it in engineering terms, you need the structures to be strong relating to each level of the intervention system. So we've tried to ensure that um, randomised trials primarily have been used to define whether anything becomes part of the triple P system. And so this has left, led us to trial and abandon interventions and not bring them into the system because they don't meet the evidence threshold that we consider to be necessary. Involvement of consumers and end users throughout the planning, implementation and evaluation process. Their allies, it's about changing the community. So um, communities need to have a say in how they want this to look and how for example, in Lane County, if it was rolling out Triple P, what Triple P would look like here is Lane County's version of it. So it has to be able to be customisable enough to be seen to be responsive to local context. Um, it needs to use programs that can be deployed in a cost effective manner. So you're looking for interventions that are deployable, that uh, can reach many people at relatively low costs. You involve the you you seek to deliver the program not through single outlets, but you have multi-agency involvement, uh, multiple diverse points of access throughout the lifespan. And so, don't just concentrate the efforts on a narrow age range of children, say under three or under five, because parenting concerns really go right throughout childhood, and good and poor parenting continue to exert an influence regardless of the child's age. Um, use the more expensive and intensive programs sparingly. So most of the effort should be about getting wide reach, low intensity, low cost programs out to the vast majority of people. Leaving other resources to be available to work with those families who are more needy, more complex, who might need uh, more intensive interventions. Work to strengthen social structures supporting parenting. This includes policy, the law, working with the media, um, building a strong communication strategy and a relationship with local media uh, is an extremely powerful, important thing because if the media really gets behind something that they see as value in a community, they can not only um, uh, have a powerful role in getting parenting messages out there, but for example, we're using um, Triple P as a way of uh, increasing the profile of newsreaders. 
So, for example, newsreaders on Channel 7 are, are partners in our statewide rollout of Triple P, and so the newsreaders will come along to major events and they're building their own personal profile as being family friendly, attuned to the needs of kids and parents in the community, and it's, um, the theory is it's going to support their ratings and their attractiveness to the population. We've also engaged major sports stars, so for example the captain of the Brisbane Broncos which is a, uh, a serious rugby league team that's uh, going to make the finals and probably win it this year, um, is an ambassador for Triple P. He tweets when he's, uh, he's just tweeted the other day saying he's just begun his Triple P online course. He's a great <laughs> advocate for dads to get involved in, in parenting programs. Um, then the deployment of a sustainable system of dissemination. Um, the thing is that you need access to high quality reliable training that can enable a changing workforce to be trained and retrained if they need to be in uh, other levels of the intervention system. We've moved right away from the train the trainer model. It is much more cost effective for agencies to contract in the training than to employ someone to deliver the training in-house because all it takes is for that one person to leave and you've lost the training capacity. And uh, you know it's expensive and time consuming to train a trainer to get to a level where they're confident and knowledgeable about the, uh, the, the system of intervention. And then finally, population level outcome data uh, needs to be captured so that you can report on outcomes uh, at a population level, the population level indicators, not just clinical outcomes of needy families who've participated in the intervention. So what I'd say in closing is that um, there is a blueprint about how you develop population level change around parenting. It is something that is actually achievable. There are now a number of examples where population level change have been achieved through the implementation of the Triple P system. Um, we're at the point where this intervention now has been evaluated in about 245 different evaluation studies. It's across 28 countries. There are hundreds and hundreds of researchers that have been involved, about 300 different academic and research institutions have been involved um, in many different languages in different parts of the world finding very similar outcomes in terms of um, benefits for children. So I leave uh, this place having been here for the last couple of days, having had a, a wonderful opportunity to meet people and to uh, lend my support to your local efforts to um, get high quality parenting programs available in the community and I'd just love to see Triple P flourish here because I think uh, the community would benefit from it. So thank you very much everyone. Thank you so much Matt, that's fantastic. It's so gratifying to hear all of the learnings and, and wisdom that you have gained over the course of these hundreds of implementations of Triple P. And speaking of implementation. We have Triple P happening here in Lane County. We're very pleased that we've begun a rollout of Triple P. We started with um, certain levels and aspects of Triple P and we hope that it's an opening wedge for continuing to build on the momentum and, and build on the system. What we are doing is that level one stay positive campaign and so we've got materials and social media and blogging and um, like traditional media posters and flyers and whatnot going out throughout the county and you can um, back there on that back table we've got lots of these guys if you want to pick some up and, and pass them around they um, have you know these gorgeous pictures on one side and then um, the five principles of positive parenting on the other and then we have some posters and anyway please help yourself to some materials back there and we have them in English and Spanish and um, we're also uh, doing a training of pediatric primary care providers coming up in a couple of weeks to help them develop consultation skills to work with families around specific concerns that the, that the parents bring to their pediatricians in the context of a well child visit or um, you know, a, a specific visit about you know, this, these tantrums are driving me crazy or I, I can't get them into bed and we're you know, yelling at each other to get out the door. And, 
parents frequently bring these kinds of concerns to pediatricians and pediatricians often don't really know, they're not well trained in how to handle these issues. And so we're um, doing this training and providing tip sheets and, and helping um, our local pediatric community to be able to, to be part of this system. And then the third thing that we're doing is implementing Triple P online. And Tr Trillium has been uh, very generous in funding this project that is a collaboration of United Way, the Early Learning Hub, LaneKids.org, Parenting Now, and Oregon Research Institute, and, um, and Lane County Public Health. And uh, it's a great collaboration, and Trillium has been the funder of it. And Trillium is funding Trillium members' access to Triple P online. And so we're also getting the word out about the availability of Triple P online. So lanekids.org is the one-stop shop for all of these activities, or you can pick up uh, material on the back table, sign up on a sheet of paper back there if you want to know more. And here at Oregon Research Institute, we're also doing a study involving Triple P, both delivered in person and online. And we have some cards back there for um, referring people into the study as well. So there are um, opportunities here for involving families in Triple P and we're delighted to be able to do so. We do have a few minutes for questions. If there are any questions from the audience or comments that you want to make or queries for Matt, you have some time. Or is it all crystal clear? <laughs> There's a lot of use of um, early, early childhood educational facilities, childcare centres and um, kindergartens and, and so on as a delivery context for Triple P. So a lot of parenting seminars can be run there. You can have staff trained to provide brief one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, in, um, with around the use of tip sheets and sort of light touch interventions. Um, we've actually developed in the midst of trialling a childcare um, version of Triple P for the workers um, who work in centres. Um, that's the foundation of trial of that has been uh, conducted in um, Alberta and Canada. Uh, so that's not deployed yet, but the, the, the principle of using an early childhood uh, uh, business uh, as a, uh, a conduit, as a vehicle for the delivery of, um, uh, of Triple P is a very familiar um, circumstance. So for example in Australia we've just had a contract entered into with Early Start Learning, which is a major childcare provider. It's got about 200 centres in the state. It's getting 200 staff trained in Triple P to deliver it all over the state. Um, so they're taking advantage of having a state government who said we'll pay for all of the training and all of the resources for everyone who wants to do it. Yeah, we didn't need the last year, so <laughs> these things change. Yes. Into understanding the problem yep. instead of going towards privatizing education. Mm. Um, I'm from Florence, I came over, and um, uh, we have a non profit which is um, the Taiso Area Partnership for the Just Future Youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the three levels of parenting in childhood from prenatal yes. all the way to seniorhood, how we can help them yep. understand the, the difficulties that they're causing not only for themselves mm. but for their families and the difficulties that they're bringing mm. up there. So um, this has been very valuable. Yeah, it's, it's interesting though when you think of parenting in relation to preventing problems that. One of, the, one of the concerns when you think about um, organisations who are about prevention of substance abuse or child maltreatment and so on is that the messaging to parenting, to parents to engage them, when it's about the avoidance of problems, they're much less attracted to it. 
than if you can inspire parents to create pull demand that by doing a parenting program it's going to advantage their children. You've got to do both, right, perhaps. Mm -hmm. No, I get, I get the, uh, the context. It, it's interesting, though, in the population trial of Triple P in South Carolina, which is the, um, the only place randomised experiment that has shown a prevalence rate reduction in child maltreatment, the word child abuse was never used once in the whole rollout. It was never used in training, it was never used in advertising material. It was all about promotion of prosociality promotion of the well-being of kids, yet the outcomes that we were, were tracking were the maltreatment outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think you lose anything by losing the linkage to the condition you're trying to prevent if you've got positive messaging that the community affiliates with and, uh, and empathises with. Because a lot of it's about emotion. It's about getting people hungry and wanting to participate in something that they see as benefit to their kids. And most, most parents of young kids aren't seeing their kids as being future delinquents or future substance abusers. So it's kind of, that's the, that's the sort of the key take home there, I think. Okay, thank you for your question though. Any other final comments or thoughts? This has been a long journey for us to get to this point. We've been working on this for 35 years since I started my PhD in 1978. Um, and uh, it's a, we're only part way there. I think for those of you who were there last night uh, uh, or yesterday afternoon when we were talking about doing triple P in low and middle income countries and realising that the vast majority of children are growing up in environments that um, lack this knowledge around positive parenting and there's a huge, distressingly huge number of kids who are exposed to extreme violence in their homes and it is really traumatising for those kids and has a tremendously adverse effect on um, the nations that these kids are, being, are growing up in. So if we can do anything to turn the needle on family violence with positive parenting, I tell you we're going to do it. <laughs>